What is up my fellow Alexandrians and welcome to Table Ready. My name is Noah and this is the Critical Review where I critically review all the episodes of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. I want to do basically some Ashton talk, a couple of ratings, and then move on to what I think would be the greatest next step in this campaign. Um, something that I think Matt and the rest of the party could do that could again contribute to that all bets are off situation. So sit tight, keep an eye out for anything that you think I might say that's incorrect, and let's get into it. First, let's talk a bit about Ashton. I am hearing that a lot of people are kind of annoyed with Ashton right now, and I understand why, or at least I think I do. There's one thing that's kind of annoying, but I think is on character, on point, and should not change. And then one thing that I think other people are picking up on that I could see as being kind of annoying and frustrating legitimately, though I don't care about it. The first is what I would describe as an overcompensation by Ashton to be helpful or kind of just on the nose about um, their desire to keep everyone together and not leave anyone behind. I do still believe that this is an overcompensation from when Lana and the rest of the party was dying and Ashton had already run away, much like the friends of Ashton ran away before when Ashton's head was cracked open and death was imminent. This I think should keep happening because it says something about Ashton and draws in something about the character that anyone in the party can engage with on their own time. The second, however, is an annoyance that I think everyone's picking up on, and it might actually have more to do with Taliesin's playing of Ashton rather than Ashton. And that is that Taliesin seems to be trying to make Ashton and Ashton's story very relevant and keeps pushing Ashton's story to the forefront when it doesn't actually fit into the storyline right now. Right now, the party is investigating, bringing Laudna back, and before that, Imogen's storyline. But Taliesin keeps kind of interjecting with these things that aren't really on story and don't really matter with the current arc. It kind of seems like Taliesin's trying to force Ashton's backstory back into relevance instead of allowing that to kind of create a scenario that would allow for Ashton's storyline to be brought forward. The reason why this might be annoying, particularly for DMs, is that we are trying to coordinate this story. We are trying to prepare things, and although the everything in the world is technically happening simultaneously, it's hard for a DM to construct a world in that way. There needs to be some form of, of linear motion um, without so many focuses in order to create a cohesive story and to be able to organize your thoughts, your notes, and your encounters. So when Taliesin throws out, oh, I want to um, them to go into my mind and dig deep and do all of these things, I wouldn't be surprised if Matt just straight up improv all of that, like all the things going on inside of Ashton's mind in order to uh, allow there to be some kind of information there. But it's very possible that that takes away from some of the depth that Matt might have wanted to place there. Taliesin might be pushing into a story too early it might not be as developed as if he just waited his turn. I don't want this to be a critique of Taliesin, so I'm not even gonna throw a rating out there, but it does bring up kind of a, a player tip that if the DM doesn't seem to be investing in your storyline at a certain time, maybe just back off and then give them the opportunity to introduce your character's backstory on their time or bring it up to them after the session to see if they're ready or not for the things that you're trying to engage with. There was a feeling of it being kind of improv and drawn out as to give Matt maybe some time to uh, to come up with some information. Some of those descriptions were unnecessarily long and I recognize that feeling like, oh, what do I do uh, now that I have to come up with something? For this encounter, I would give it an 8 out of 10, just because if Matt is improving, having them trapped in the mind is amazing. It stops the party where they are and allows him time to come up with better, more uh, fitting information to give to the party. Also, I think it was cool that he created this wall between uh, FCG diving deeper and Imogen who could not when she failed. It made a, a consequence for that role that I thought was really interesting. What do you think about... Uh, the, all the different versions of Ashton in the mind. I wonder if some identify differently or if this is all of the potential avenues I think that Travis suggested, or in my opinion, I think it has something to do with the multiverse. There might be different versions of each of these characters in a different universe or environment. So maybe one of the Ashtons is a politician in Faerun, while another is this one that you see here. Kinda cool. My last thought on Ashton, 
There was a moment when Ashton threw Treshy into the portable hole, but wasn't that after Imogen put Ladna's unwrapped body into the portable hole? Is Treshy just sitting in this portable hole with a dead body of their friend? That's f***ed up. Moving on, Oren brings up some pretty critical information about when his loved ones were killed and how Keyleth couldn't really bring them back because of the way that they were killed. He also mentions that there might be an issue with Laudna that Keyleth either will not or is not interested in helping, so he suggests going to Whitestone. This was a solid idea that pays off later. The party takes a lot of time at Lord Estros' estate to figure out what to do next, and most of the episode is actually them just communicating about it. All this before they finally do meet up with Keyleth. Keyleth lets them know that she's a little confused about what they're asking about, figures it out, and then opens a portal to Whitestone, which is dope interesting and leads to what I think the party or all of Critical Role should be doing next. I have two thoughts in mind. First, a one shot that should absolutely happen. Second, what happens in Whitestone. It is my opinion that the next one shot should be an attack on Estros's estate. Estros has all of these traps and has kind of been waiting for the opportunity to exercise his defenses against a formidable opponent. Let's see if a group of adventurers, maybe Brennan, maybe some other people from Exandria, can try to play the bad guys going to attack the estate, and their results will define what happens while the party is gone. If they come back and don't find Estros, or have a ransom note, or if Estros kills them all, and they show up and are like, well, hot dog, daddy Estros, you man. It could be a straight savage high death one shot that I think would be extraordinarily entertaining and it gives Matt the opportunity to flex for one of his NPCs. Second is Whitestone. As the party heads into Whitestone with Keyleth, I think it's important to remember that a lot of the party is there or could be there quickly. If Keyleth shows up in Whitestone, it's very possible that the Dorolos and uh, Pike show up. Pike being someone that she might consult with to see what they can do. Where Pike goes, Grog goes. Oh my gosh, this would be perfect too if it was around like the Halloween episode and they were all able to, to like cosplay their Vox Machina characters here for it. <laughs> Let me repaint the scene here. They start off and the uh, the table's empty just with Matt playing Keyleth and then Orem at the table, kind of as a middleman between the new party, the Mighty Nine, and Vox Machina. Then as they go to meet some of these other people like Pike, the, the players come back to the table playing their Vox Machina characters. Pike, Grog, Vex, Percy. I don't know if Scanlan would be there. Honestly, probably not. They all kind of come back and coalesce at the table. This would be great because the original party could talk to one another about how to best go about this scenario because they're all connected to Delilah, Briarwood in that story arc. It would give us insights into where the party is now, what their current belief systems are, and how touchy it may or may not be that someone wants to be resurrected that's connected so closely to Delilah. They could have arguments and we could watch the party still uh, role play as their old characters at high level without making it seem as though they are just snapping their fingers and solving the problem if they were all played by Matt. It would also be a really touching moment of role play for us because I've been enjoying the, the shout outs and the callbacks to campaign one and campaign two, but I do think that it needs to stop at some point. This campaign needs to have a, a strong identity of its own that separates completely from the original campaigns. And this could be a great send off to Vox Machina and allow this party to really establish their own story, moving on from this, saying goodbye to the Vox Machina characters as played by their players. Yeah, it would just be a, a great shout out to all the OG critters, and I think it would be satisfying enough for us to move on from the older campaigns. That's really all I got for today, but there is one other rating I have to give, and that is the nine out of 10 to Travis for straight up calling out Laura here. Hey lady. <laughs> Fresh cut grass here. Wow, that was a big waste. <laughs> okay, Justin. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for watching guys. That's all I have for you today. Make sure that you hop down in the comments section below. Tell me what I got wrong. I definitely put one in there. Also, if you wouldn't mind making a mage hand out of that like button, going over and hitting subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. All right, see you soon. Peace.